hello, my name is Charlie McCready and I am a parental alienation coach who has real life experience of parental alienation. And I'm glad to say that I've now come through this and I'm reunited with both of my children. As part of our campaign to raise awareness and to help parents to navigate the complex world of parental alienation, we'd like to reach out to experts that we believe are making a real difference and can provide valuable insights to parents just like you. So I'm delighted today that I'm being joined by Dr. Kathleen Ray, who is an internationally recognized expert in high conflict divorce, parental alienation, parent-child estrangement, and child emotional abuse and related trauma. Dr. Ray has significant experience providing print, radio, podcast, and television interviews worldwide. Her clinical career has been dedicated to helping alienated ch children and their families move forward. She has worked with 5,000 plus alienated children and their families in varying roles, including clinical practitioner in private practice, child custody evaluator, expert witness, coach, consultant, and the founder and clinical director of the Family Reflections Reunification Program for severely alienated children and their families. Dr. Ray is the author or co-author of several peer-reviewed published parental alienation research studies. Her 2011 book, Toxic Divorce, a workbook for alienated parents, won international book awards, first place winner in the parenting family, divorce category and award-winning finalist in self-help, relationships category at the 2012 International Book Awards in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Ray's newest book, Blindsided by Parental Alienation, Proven Strategies to Reconnect with Your Child will be published in early 2024. Dr. Ray has also specifically designed a wellness retreat for alienated parents and grandparents and will share some information about this wonderful opportunity for you to consider attending this broadcast. So Dr. Ray, I'm delighted to have you here this evening and thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me, Charlie. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. And to, to get us kicked off, um, let's start with, with um, a question which I know you know a lot about. So is there a scientific way for clinicians and forensic practitioners to evaluate children of separating and divorced parents concerning the possible diagnosis of parental alienation? And if so, what's one major feature that severely alienated children exhibit that non-alienated children do not exhibit? Wow, great question. Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> Parental <laughs> alienation is a complex phenomenon that manifests along a continuum, developing from mild to moderate to severe levels of alienation. And the criteria for the diagnosis of parental alienation uh, were originally formulated by Dr. Richard Gardner and consist of eight behavioral manifestations that are commonly accepted. The number of these behavioral manifestations exhibited increases with the severity of the alienation. Lack of ambivalence is one of the eight criteria and it can be quantitatively measured Interpersonal relationships usually feature ambivalence, but children who experience severe parental alienation exhibit splitting, idealizing the alienating parent and devaluing the target parent. And splitting is a common feature of moderate to severe alienation, and it's been objectively measured. For example, Dr. William Burnett, Dr. Gregory, Dr. Rohner, and I co-researched and co-authored a study titled An Objective Measure of Splitting in Parental Alienation, the Parental Acceptance Rejection Questionnaire. And it was published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences in 2017. In the study, we hypothesized that a psychological test the Parental Acceptance Rejection Questionnaire, referred to as the PARQ, could distinguish severely alienated 
from non-alienated children. The participants in our study consisted of 116 children or youth ranging from nine through 17 years of age. And the PARQ was administered to each participant. And this test was administered to 45 severely alienated children who had been recruited from the Family Reflections Reunification Program, which happens to be the program that I founded and um, have been the clinical director of. It's a four day intensive reunification program for severely alienated children and their families. And just as a, a, a important feature here, uh, we've had children literally from all over the world uh, who have come and participated in the program. Now, all of these kids prior to being enrolled in our program are deemed severely alienated by the court system. So um, I think that's a very, very important thing to point out in terms of how we came about uh, um, in recruiting um, severely alienated children for this particular study. 71 non-alienated children consisting of three groups also participated in the study. And the first group consisting of 35 children came from intact families. The second group consisting of 20 children came from divorced or separated families. So these children continue to see both parents on a regular basis. The third group consisting of 16 neglected children whose parents were divorced or separated. Parents and the children did not see both parents on a regular basis. And all of the neglected children lived with their mothers and rarely or never saw their fathers. In short, the results of our study demonstrated that severely alienated children engaged in a high level of splitting by perceiving the preferred parent in extremely positive terms and the rejected parent in extremely negative terms. Splitting was not manifested by the children in the other three groups. From there, we co-authored a subsequent study titled Measuring the Difference Between Parental Alienation and Parental Estrangement, the PARQ gap. And this was also published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences in 2020, ARQ gap score, which measures the difference between each child RQ father score and PARQ mother score. And this study determined that using a PARQ gap score of 90 as a cut point resulted in 99% accuracy in identifying severely alienated children. So this research presents a critical way for clinicians and forensic practitioners to evaluate children of separating and divorced parents concerning the possible diagnosis of parental alienation. I mean, this is this is incredible stuff, Kathleen. In in terms of its application and the way that that this can be used. Because I mean, you, I imagine you have the same challenge everywhere. That that it's the diagnosis of alienated children that seems to be so difficult for practitioners. And how, how, how do you think we might be able to get the PARQ gap test made more of, uh, available to the professional practitioners? Well, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I, think, I think number one is education. And um, I'm doing my very best to provide that education. I offer a training program for um, psychologists, social workers, counselors, anybody in the mental health profession, uh, and particularly child custody evaluators. I mean, that, they are number one on my list to try and um, get as many trained as possible to use the PARQ in doing their evaluations. Because let's face it, what happens in these cases is 
the alienating parent will typically say, no, the children are not alienated, they're estranged from the other parent. And so this particular test, you know, now keep in mind, you can't just, uh, a, you know, clinician or a friend, forensic practitioner can't just use this one test to determine it. There's a, you know, whole bunch of battery of tests that need to be used besides this one, uh, as well as other, you know, aspects of what goes into, um, you know, interviewing families and so on and so forth. But simply what I'm trying to say here is that this is a very important tool and I'm trying to do my best to reach out. I offer uh, virtual training programs, like I said, and people can um, contact me and uh, I'd be more than happy to offer that to groups of clinicians and others interested. Excellent. And, and at the end of this podcast, there will be more information about how anybody who, who is a professional can get in contact with you and um, look, at, look, look at how they can get that training with you. I think that's such a, a wonderful tool. Um, and all the parents who are watching this as well will be delighted to think that, you know, here is some real support, which has been sorely missing in, in this whole sphere. So one of the most distressing scenarios for parents are where they have no contact with their children. So what, what do you think are helpful tips for encouraging a, a kid, um, a no contact kid to reconnect with an alienated parent? There are quite a few. So let me see if I can give you at least 10 right now. Would that sound okay? That'd be brilliant. So a no contact kid is moderately to severely alienated, definitely severely. And therefore a gradual, consistent and patient approach is one of the best ways to attempt to reconnect with the child. Uh, two, it's important to take small baby steps and be willing to work through any issues that may arise along the way. What you say depends on the situation. And there are, however, some universal truths about what to say versus what not to say to a severely alienated child. You see, it's, it's not just what you say, it's how you go about saying and doing it. And that's the really tough part for parents who are completely cut off from their children. The third thing I would say is that it's really advisable for rejected parents to make occasional and unexpected attempted contact with their alienated child using various forms of communication throughout the year. These communications should consist of simple, heartfelt messages that express your concern and love for your child and may also reference positive memories from the past because that's an important feature for the reunification process. Keeping the communication concise and respectful is very crucial. And this approach may slowly help to break down the barriers that have been created and could ultimately lead to a reconciliation. The fourth tip I'd like to offer is consider sending thoughtful gifts or a heartfelt card to reach out to them. And if at all possible, have a trustworthy friend deliver your gifts to your child somewhere safe. For example, if appropriate, given your circumstances, perhaps a friend can hand your gift and or a card to your severely or moderately alienated child at their school or at a playground. And in your card, write something like, hey, I'm thinking about you and I'm hoping that we can see each other sometime soon. You wanna keep it positive and uplifting. The fifth tip is moderate to severely alienated children need to know that they're loved and valued, that their rejected parent wants to be involved in their lives. And this can help to counter feelings of rejection and abandonment that likely has arisen 
during the period of no contact throughout the alienation process. The sixth tip I can think of is when expressing your love and desire to be a part of your child's life, be specific and genuine. You can tell them how much they mean to you, how much you miss them, how much you're looking forward to spending time with them or how much you want to be there for them. Seven, your alienated child has been programmed to believe that you are a horrible, mean, cruel, dangerous, unworthy parent among many other negative things. And if the child asks you, why did you do something that you didn't do, then it's important to say, I'm sorry that you were told this about me. I have never stopped loving you. And provide accurate information and counteract any false statements made about you, but also at the same time, and this is very tricky, I know, but you want to be sensitive when doing so because these kids find it hard to accept new information that contradicts what they've been told before. And it may take time for them to come around to new information. The eighth thing or eighth tip I can think of is that in certain cases, a rejected parent may need to express some remorse for something that genuinely occurred in the past in order to regain trust. And if that's the case, you'll need to demonstrate feeling bad or feeling remorse through whatever your actions and behavior may have been at the time. And most importantly, be ready to work on yourself and the relationship with your child, even when it's difficult or uncomfortable. Number nine, be realistic about the current state of the relationship. Keep a lid on expectations because going back to normalcy instantly may be impossible. It really takes time for the child to trust and open up to you again, especially when you're dealing with a severely alienated child. And number 10, your child may not be ready to talk right away. So be patient and let them know that you are available to listen whenever they're ready. Fantastic, thank you for that. I was just thinking about one of the things that you were talking about that was for, for a, saying sorry to the child. So, so a, um, an untruth has been, many untruths get told about us, that you handle that beautifully by saying, I'm sorry that you were told this about me. And I'm particularly interested because I know that some, um, some practitioners, especially during reunification, and we're going to cover that a bit later, encourage parents to admit fault for all the things that they haven't actually done. And that makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't know if you have a view as to should parents admit to things that they haven't done as well. I totally do not agree with that whatsoever. Um, to me, that's a lie. So yeah. why would you lie about something that, you know, did not occur? Um, no, absolutely. I, I don't agree with that whatsoever. I, I feel vindicated <laughs> because I, yeah. I, I, I often say to parents, yeah, why would you want to do that? And I know that, you know, Again, in, even in some professional hands, they've been encouraged to do that as part of the reunification process. And I've encouraged parents to, to kind of do, do, dodge the ones where they've been accused of doing something they haven't done and just listen. And then where if, if it is something that they have done, then, you know, take it on board and say, yes, I'm sorry for having done that, you know, and I'm sorry how that might have helped, hurt you. And then you've, you've kind of, you're, you're facilitating the rebuilding relationship with your child, but you're not admitting to things that you haven't done, which I, I think is counterproductive. And and what about what about some of the things that parents shouldn't do? Because there's lots of bear traps out there. Right now, I can, the top of my head, there's probably five different things that I can think of. Um, the first one is don't attempt to go visit your alienated child on your, uh, sorry, I meant to say you're severely, 
alienated child on your own. It's way too vulnerable a situation. And sadly, but true, you may be met with a false accusation of some form of abuse. The second tip is don't go overboard and trying to show how much you care and want to be back in their lives. Otherwise, you're clearly going to receive pushback from your severely alienated child. The more you try, the harder it comes for them. And parents often ask me why. And the, the answer is the favored parent is always keeping a good eye on them. It's all about control. Mm -hmm. The alienator is so preoccupied by their need to protect the child because in their eyes, you are not worthy of the children's love. You're a dangerous parent. And you got to remember that the alienator and the severely alienated child share a delusional world. The third tip is please don't blame the child for the alienation because your child is not at all responsible for it. We know who is. I don't think I have to say who that is. Um, number four, remember your alienated child thinks you're the devil and their favorite parent is their worshiper. So don't say anything negative or critical about the alienating parent, as this will undoubtedly reinforce the child's negative feelings towards you. And five, don't be pushy or insistent on a relationship. As I said earlier, be patient and understanding. And there's one other thing I just want to emphasize here, and that is it's it's crucial not to lose hope. Never, never, never give up on your no contact child or youth. You know, you may need to take a break to look after your overall physical and mental well-being, which is important. That's so important. But never entirely give up on your no contact child or youth. Let me tell you something. I have had the pleasure of working with over 5,000 alienated children. And um, the large majority of that number of children are or were all severely alienated. And from doing reunification work in particular, every single child ended up telling me that they were always longing for a strong and loving bond with their rejected parent. Mm. The problem was they couldn't express this desire until they became liberated from the harmful influence of the abusive, alienating parent. And I, I think that is such a positive message for, for parents. It's something that I... I I talk about to parents quoting uh, kind of the experiences that experts such as yourself have had with these alienated children as to how important it is to, to keep that door open, to, you know, persist with the messages, persist with the communications, even when it appears to be falling on deaf ears. And as you say, it's a, it's a permission thing that they can't respond because they're not being allowed to at that point in time. Absolutely. And you know, here, here's just one example of how quickly that happens. So with the Family Reflections Reunification Program, um, when the children are being brought to our program, I have youth workers and, and myself are the ones who actually go and pick them up. So whether we fly to whatever destination they're living at or, or if they live, you know, within the province that I'm in, in Canada, whatever it may be, we're the ones who actually get or pick the children up. Mm. We don't, we don't use, um, you know, other kinds of services. And we find that that's extremely beneficial because the children are able to, first of all, begin to build rapport with our youth workers, as well as with me, although keeping in mind that 
you know, initially the kids think I'm the devil, um, just like the judges for, you know, court ordering um, our program. But it doesn't take long for them to, you know, soon uh, begin to build that rapport with me. But what I'm trying to really get at here that I find so fascinating is it's called the rear view approach. And that is as soon as we leave the home that the child and the alienator have been living in together, it's just unbelievable how all of a sudden, because they can no longer, they're no longer in the control, right, of the alienating parent, that rear view mirror that my staff and I refer to it as, they just, all of a sudden, we see this incredible change in them. It's just, it's like a light bulb mm. that goes off and you can see how all of a sudden they feel free. Yeah. It's yeah. almost like, you know, getting their- Get out of jail free. Get, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's it's absolutely unmistakable in yeah. terms of what we notice that way. Have you also seen any patterns that emerge with regards the sorts of ages when when children become more receptive to having a relationship with with an alienated parent again? Well, it, looking at it from a cognitive perspective, um, you know, the older the older children uh, definitely are, uh, I think they catch on a little bit quicker in the way we do it because our program is, is all educational. So they pick up and they're able to put the pieces of the puzzle together as opposed to the younger children. But our, our, our approach and how we work with the younger children, of course, is, is based on, you know, where they're at from a... Uh, developmental perspective. It's one of those questions I, I keep on being asked by people. A a alienated parents like to ask the impossible questions of when, because I guess they're all looking for certainty. And that that's one of the things that we can give them lots of support. But as you say, hope is that there is no certainty, but there is hope. And they just have to keep moving through the reality Absolutely. of today until they get to that, that point of hope. Yeah. Yeah, it breaks my heart when, you know, I I I hear or I read or see where a, a a rejected parent has finally said I can't do this anymore and and um that's it. I'm just I'm it's done. It's over, right? And and I feel I feel so sad for them. I really do. And I mean, I totally understand how and why and how they've gotten to be at that place. But at the same time, because I know from all of my experiences in working with severely alienated children, that there is hope when one does try to persevere. But I also recognize, and I mean, this is just a, another huge topic that we could focus on some other time, is that the primary reason that so many parents often give up is they have really no choice financially, right? Mm. I mean, you know, if you go bankrupt, um, what a horrible, what a horrible thing to happen. And, you know, the cost of, of the family court process and all of that, it's, it's, it's a tragedy. It really is. And I just really hope that things can change that way in the future. And indeed, it, the, these sorts of informational interviews are, are very, very helpful for everybody in learning a lot more about parental alienation and the reality of that situation. So we hear a lot about reunification and for many parents, this has been a, a very poor experience. And sometimes it's even damaged the relationship that they were going in to try and fix. But I know that, that this is one of the specialist areas for you and you are very successful with it. So I'd like to give parents some hope and also a much better understanding of what your program is and how it can help them and their children. Sure. I'd love to describe what a successful reunification looks like, including the key ingredients 
given I've had a tremendous amount of success in reunifying severely alienated children with their rejected parents. Now, let me start off by saying that, as previously mentioned, a rejected parent may be able to reconcile with an alienated child. However, in severe alienation cases, it's extremely rare, if not impossible, for that to happen without a court ordering an intensive reunification program. It's absolutely imperative that a court orders a bona fide specialist in the field because parental alienation is a highly specialized area requiring a unique skill set. And sadly, there are mental health professionals who, who refer to themselves as reunification therapists, mm. but they haven't undergone the proper training, clinical supervision, and experience necessary to work with this highly specialized population. So, sorry to interrupt you. It but can I, I, just a question there. Is there reunification for non-alienated children or is it only for alienated children? Well, with the services that um, that I offer and, and um, my staff, we also offer, we don't call it reunification, we call it reconciliation. But mm -hmm. for and and these are for cases of estrangement. So we deal with them very, very differently, depending on the on you know what the actual forms or types of estrangement that occurred. So yes, there is such a thing. Um, however, my specialty, of course, has always been working with the severely alienated children. Please continue telling me more about that program. I, I think this is such a, a an important asset for, for anybody who, who, is, who has a court order to go down that route. Just going back to what I was saying about those who are not trained and, and may refer to themselves as reunification therapists, they, unfortunately, but true, um, can, can create some really significant or engage in really significant errors that lead to very, very poor outcomes for families. For example, traditional therapeutic approaches, you know, periodic meetings with a professional at their offices do not help to reestablish the bond between the child and rejected parent. And unfortunately, but true, many judges don't understand that. And, and you know, as much as individuals like myself are trying to help judges understand that you please do not order you know traditional therapeutic approaches because it's going to backfire it's not going to work it's actually going to make matters even worse it's, it's catastrophic mm. and ultimately the alienated child and favored parent who often if not always they continue to live together so they feel the need to dig in their heels and prove their point, thereby further entrenching their distorted views. So it is absolutely necessary that a rejected parent and their legal representative do their homework and ensure they're going to get a bona fide parental alienation reunification therapist who has a very high success rate, um, best to have, you know, uh, published peer-reviewed uh, studies showing how successful their program is um, so that they can reestablish a relationship between the severely alienated child and the rejected parent in a very safe manner. The primary objectives of, of the Family Reflections Reunification Program and I often refer to it in short as either Family Reflections or the FRRP. Our objectives are to reconcile children between 8 and 18 years of age with their rejected normative parent to foster a healthy relationship between the child and his or her rejected parent. And our program facilitates a swift, 
emotionally safe reunification between children or youths and rejected parents. We also provide the favored parents with necessary emotional support and assistance from a trained therapist during that time. So I, I just want to preface here again or emphasize that the alienating parent does not come to our actual retreat. It's the child and the rejected parent that come to our retreat. Okay, but another therapist is working with the favored parent at that time and provides other necessary intervention strategies for maintaining a, su a successful reunification. And this inter intervention model has worked very, very well with high conflict families that exhibit extremely rigid organizational patterns. And trends suggest that the most effective treatment response for these cases is a family systems approach. So we don't just involve the children and the rejected parent, but we will also involve any step parents, step siblings, and other extended family members on the last day of our intensive reunification program. Um, we actually have eight primary goals and the first one is to promote healthy child adjustment. The second is to improve the child's critical thinking skills. Third, help the child understand how and why the alienation occurred. Or we help the alienating parent understand how and why the alienation occurred. And then five, work with each family member to help create more appropriate parent-parent and parent-child roles, responsibilities, and boundaries. Six, we strengthen each parent's ability to communicate with each other and resolve relevant parent-parent and parent-child conflicts. And seven, of course, very important, maintain the reunification process. And eight, promote relationships between the child and both parents, unless there are specific circumstances that preclude such a relationship. So the FRRP relies on the court's findings from hearing testimonies and reviewing evidence of family dynamics. And our program operates based on two premises that the court has determined. First, the child is safe under the care of the rejected parent. And second, the favored parent has at least interfered with and or not properly supported the relationship between the other parent and their child. And that's why we require a court order for admission into our program. And as I think I may have mentioned earlier, we accept court orders from all over the world, um, you know, primarily our court orders have come from Canada, the United States, um, but we've also had court orders from other parts of Europe um, mm -hmm. and other countries. So our team is willing to travel to other places to do the reunification program. Our actual retreat is located on the Vancouver Island, uh, which is uh, very close to the city of Vancouver. It's just a hop, skip, and a jump away, either by seaplane or jet or, or um, no, actually it's not jet, it's a propeller plane, uh, <laughs> or ferries, uh, including a new fast ferry. So um, no matter what, like I said, we're, we're available to do it um, at our retreat or elsewhere but we do require certain court order stipulations. It's, it's wonderful that you have the availability to do that in other parts of, of the world. So if, if parents outside, particularly outside of Canada and the US, um, how easy is it to facilitate a, a reunification process for somebody in, in Europe, for instance? Um, so my experience has been, I mean, there is a lot of planning that that has to go into it, obviously, and that is usually done um, with the uh, attorneys or lawyers who are representing the 
rejected parent in, in the hope that they're going to get the proper court order. So, I mean, in some cases, uh, it, it's been months where, you know, we've tried to find the most appropriate place to, to, um, to do the retreat. Um, there, there's a tremendous amount of planning that can go into it. I can imagine. And how, how long does, how long did the, um, the target parent and the child typically need to be at the retreat for, for the program to be effective? So our program is strictly four days. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I said, it's intensive work, although they, um, you know, the way our program is, is designed, they do spend a lot of time together and with our youth workers engaging in all different kinds of uh, activities and again depending on the time of year you know if they like to ski they can go skiing together or if they like to fish they go fishing together zip lining you name it there's so many different activities where our retreat is located that they have many many choices on what they want to do uh, let me share an interesting story with you. This is one with one of our very first severely alienated children that came to our retreat. And um, <clears throat> they were, when we were having dinner together with this boy, he was about, he was around eight years old at the time. And he was looking out on the water and he saw people fishing. And he said, I hate fishing. And I knew why, because I knew the history of the family. You see, his rejected father and him, when prior to the alienation occurring, they used to fish all the time. Mm. That was a really special thing that they both did together. And so, of course, when he first arrives at the retreat, and of course, we haven't started the reunification process yet, that was the immediate first thing that came to mind when he saw these people fishing. Yeah. Well, guess what? Not too long after that, when he was reunified with his dad and he started putting all the pieces of the puzzle together based on, um, you know, how our educational um, modules work, the two of them went fishing together. It was just a wonderful, wonderful sight to see. Amazing yeah. experience. Yeah. And what what a, what a, a change in mindset. For, for, for that young boy to have had. And what, what are the sorts of um, activities or follow-up actions is it helpful for parents to do after the retreat? Well, with our program, we, we actually um, offer an aftercare services component. And um, it used to be a uh, mandated for one year where the families would have to um, engage in aftercare services with a therapist that um, either one whom I had trained or, um, you know, that I had really interviewed well to make sure that they were going to, you know, really do what was necessary in terms of our follow-up care services. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it, and that worked really, really well. Now, what we have found over time is that it's not necessary for a mandated one year aftercare services, because mm -hmm. again, each and every family is different in in how they go about, um, you know, life after the reunification has taken place. So we do definitely have a ninety day minimum no contact order between the um, the child and the alienating parent. And um, I won't get into a whole lot of specifics about that. Maybe we can do that another time. Um, and, and I mean, we have had a case where it wasn't necessary for the full 90 days. Um, you know, things went really, really well in terms of the alienating parent um, doing, you know, what, what was necessary to begin um, a step-by-step -step progression in, in getting back together with the child and, and all. But, you know, for the most part, I mean, we do find that for some parents, it does take a little bit longer because they, 
they're just not ready to do the work. They're in denial. They still believe that the judge was wrong or, or mm. you know, so was, many different, different I was just going to ask about that because the, the experience that, that parents who are the rejected parents will typically have of um, of the alienating parent it, or the favoured parent is, is they are very difficult people to deal with. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I imagine that would be very challenging for, for you know, the practitioners that you're using. They're obviously very skilled to be able to deal with this. Um, but I was just wondering if you wanted to elaborate a little bit on, on some of the, you know, maybe some of the, the, the ways in which you encourage these, um, these, these parents to start behaving themselves and being more concerned about the child's well-being rather than just their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a particular, you know, again, educational process that we we use. Um, the, the, for the most part, and, and I mean, this is based on scientific, um, you know, evidence, 99% of severely alienating parents tend to have um, either personality disorder traits or full-blown personality disorder or perhaps mm -hmm. more than one um, personality disorder. And so the aftercare team and or the therapists that work with the alienating parents, um, we have to ensure that they really understand and have great experience in working with personality disordered patients or clients. And that's a hard part because uh, not every clinician is open to or is comfortable in working with um, personality disordered individuals. So, you know, they're very, very special people who do this kind of work, believe me. I can, I can imagine. It's, it's something, and this might be an, an unfair question and might require much more detailed answer, but do, do you think that the people with these personality disorders, do you think this is a, a nature or nurtured aspect of, of who they are? So do you think that it's something that's related to an experience that they've had earlier in their lives, or do you think it's just an inherent, inherent part of their, their natural character? For the most part, I believe that it is based on some very, very significant trauma that took place in their earlier lives. I'm, I'm again, very glad to be vindicated because e each, I think pretty much every case that I've come across that the person who has that personality disorder is as a result of the trauma. And equally, we as parents come into this with, with our own um, I don't want to use the term baggage, but our own issues, our own memories, which which are affecting us directly when we go through our experience of, of parental alienation, which which segues very neatly with with the next question that I have for you, which is, I think a lot of parents, they start by focusing all of their attention on their children, which is a natural thing to do because you're empathetic, you want to, you're, you're, you're concerned about your child. What tips would you have about parents and their own, you know, mental and emotional well-being and how, how, what they should be doing for themselves? Yeah, great question. Well, many alienated parents and grandparents, like those of you who are watching this show, feel disconnected, stressed, hoodwinked blindsided and overwhelmed due to the strain of your relationships and undoubtedly you often struggle to find a way to reconnect with yourself and your loved ones the emotional pain of being alienated from family members can be devastating leading to feelings of isolation sadness and loss and it can also seriously impact your mental and physical well-being. That's why I actually specially designed uh, a wellness retreat for alienated parents and grandparents. And certainly if they would like, they can bring their loved ones in support of others. 
there's actually a, a very short video that perhaps if you're open to it, Charlie, you could share that because it ultimately describes what the wellness retreat is all about. And I personally think it's such an important part of um, a, a parent's own experience. And I'm, I'm a firm believer that if you really want to help your children, you have to be coming from a place of strength and confidence and stability yourself, because otherwise I think you end up focusing on your needs rather than your, your children's needs, or you get triggered. And so I, I think, you know, your, your advice for people to really focus on themselves is, is so critical. This wellness retreat is, you know, at a beautiful setting where, again, they'll be able to just completely get away from all of the, the stress and everything else that comes with being an alienated parent. It's going to be a transformative experience for these parents so that when they go home, they will be able to handle things very differently from the past mm -hmm. in life, all over, you know, in, in every aspect. So I'm very, very excited about it. And that, that's in just a few days they, they can make this sort of transformational change. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It's just well, like my four-day intensive reunification program with the children, that this is a four days of a wellness retreat with rejected parents mm -hmm. or grandma. And yeah. is, this, is this the sort of thing that you would encourage them to think about doing even before going on, say, a reunification program, almost like a preparatory exercise? Absolutely, because I don't think they're going to need it after <laughs> the reunification <laughs> program. So, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And also, it, it just dawns on me that, that this is the sort of thing that would be really good for them in the cases of no contact. It's kind of getting themselves into a better space yes. and then doing all, you know, the 10 great tips that you had of things that you should do and five great tips, things you shouldn't do. And that with a combination of looking after yourself as well. So it sounds like a great recipe for, for people to kind of, yeah, it really engage with. And it's an investment in themselves. Yes, it is. And what I'm so impressed with so far is, um, you know, we we have people who have signed up that are coming from South America, you know, and I mean, wow, <laughs> you know, I, I never expected that, but I'm, I'm very, very thrilled. So, you know, there's people that are coming from various parts of the world to this wellness retreat. And um, I, I, I think that's wonderful. I really do. It, it is. And such, and it's so important for people. I, 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 again, I see lots of parents who just put their life on hold and they kind of forget about themselves. Um, and it's almost as if you want to shake them and say, you don't need to do this. You, you can make, you can give yourself permission the same way that our children don't have permission to have a relationship with us. We don't yes. give ourselves permission to enjoy our lives again we feel you know guilty and remorseful and we didn't create the situation that that that's on the the parents who've you know put our our kids through this terrible experience absolutely yeah. and the fun part too is and and um you know your audience will see this when they watch the uh, the video clip that they get, you know, we're going to be hanging out with, with all of them, right? This is, this is not what I would call a formal, it's not a conference or anything like that. We're actually hanging out with them. So um, there's uh, some other PA experts from the United States and, and Canada, uh, both, um, you know, in the legal and mental health fields who uh, are bona fide PA experts. So, um, you know, we'll be, we can eat together, we'll be engaging in all sorts of activities together, including things like, um, oh my gosh, I mean, I don't want to give all the surprises away, but there's a lot of fun things that we're going to be doing together that just um, just being in your company for, for a period of a few days and, and just immersing themselves in this, I can yeah, see exactly, real power exactly. behind that. One, one last kind of major area of question to ask you about, which is, we're coming up to the Christmas season. And this is always a really tough time for, for parents. Uh, and again, I'm really interested in, in your kind of views as to 
how, what, what parents should be thinking about doing or how can they make this a better experience? Yeah, another great question. Um, yeah, this is a really, really tough time for, for so many parents and especially those who have no contact with their children. And although the holiday season can be tough, my advice is don't let that bring you down. Instead, focus on the things that bring you joy. Dedicate time to activities that, you know, make you happy, whether it's reading a good book, watching a good movie, going for a morning run, or engaging in something that you haven't done for a while. Um, one parent I was just consulting with recently said, okay, I've decided that I'm going to do some painting and writing and I'm going to play some video games and I thought wow that's terrific you know because this particular parent has not done that over the past three or so years that mm. he's been alienated um you know I encourage parents to you know do things like puzzles have a bubble bath you name it make sure to stay connected with loved ones virtually mm. uh, if not you know if you can't do it in person because even a simple conversation can go a long way and also I want to remind your audience that you know you don't have to celebrate if you're not feeling up for it consider taking a break especially from social media to give yourself some much needed self-care and if you're feeling up for it think about going out and doing some volunteer work or going for a long walk, whatever it may be to help you feel better, both physically, mentally, and even spiritually. And don't forget to treat yourself to something special. And lastly, writing down your goals for the upcoming year can give you something positive to focus on. You know, you've got this, you can do it. At the same time, however, if you're struggling, please reach out to your general practitioner or a mental health professionals for support. And, um, you know, here in Canada, for example, you know, I, I would say call 911 if you need to. Not sure what you use in the UK. Um, do you have 911 or what do you we, do? We've got 999. Yeah. I think also just building on what you're, what you're saying as well is you're, you're encouraging parents to kind of do positive things, to keep active, and maybe they should be thinking as well about planning it out a little bit. So, you know, think about, it's only a few weeks away. Get, yes. get you know, start thinking about what you're going to do in two weeks' time rather than, you know, Christmas Eve or some other time when it's too late. At, at least if you know you're going to be doing something, then, you, you, you know, you've got something to look forward to. And also, advice, I, I think as well with parents, so many of us, we all, because we, we have this habit of putting our lives on hold, we say, what if our kid reaches out to us? And what if I make plans for Christmas Day and then something else happens? Uh, and I think if what if happens, deal with it at that point. Uh, otherwise, just, you know, get on with your life as best as best you can. But I, I think your advice is really, really excellent. It's, 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 it's really, really helpful. Well, thank you. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. And um, well, that, that was an amazing session, Dr. Ray. Thank, thank you so much for, for coming along and joining me. I thought that was, it was insightful. It was practical. It's valuable. You've given parents some really wonderful insights as to, you know, how to reach out to kids they don't have contact with, um, lots of do's and don'ts, how to look after themselves. It, it's, hope i'm hoping that they will all come flooding to you for reunification and also um to go on the retreat which are two and also they can get the reunification anywhere in the world um so thank you very much for for, for joining me today that i i really do appreciate that thank you so much for having me charlie a pleasure and um, and for anybody who'd like to contact dr a i'm putting her details up now um, and we look forward to seeing you at another point in time in the future. Thank you for joining us tonight.